What are some of the most concerning data that you see in America today that you're sitting there saying things are not going to be good? And if it's something where you are saying things are not going to be good, how bad are things going to be in the U.S. economy the next 12, 24, 36, 60 months? Okay, well, there's a good comparison, and that is 2008. And, and then, you know, what happened since 2020? In 2008, we had essentially a, a bubble collapsing that was more similar to the Japanese situation. So the banks were creating a lot of credit um, that was used for um, property, but also various financial instruments. So you had your asset price surge. And once bank credit suddenly tightened, which happened very dramatically in September 2008, and the banking system essentially shut down, then the asset bubble collapses. And we saw that. Um, now, at that time, the Federal Reserve acted very quickly. In fact, among internationally, among central banks, it was the one that reacted fastest and also in the, in the, in the most proactive way. Um, but the key thing is, Bank credit shrank after that for you know for a year. Bank credit just did not expand, and that's the biggest part. That's the money supply. The Federal Reserve stepped in. It created a lot of credit um, on its own. A lot of people said that this would create inflation now, and the dollar would collapse because look what the Fed is doing. Um, I was one of the few who were saying no, the the dollar is not going to collapse, and there's not going to be inflation. Why? Because the Fed is a small. Cog and, and the big wheel is the banking system, and they're shrinking. So the total money supply was actually not expanding, despite the, the Fed being hyperactive. Now, the Fed did implement one of my policy recommendations from the true quantitative easing that I'd formulated in 1995, which is, and, and my true def, and the definition of true quantitative easing, of course, is to increase bank credit creation for the real economy. How do you do that? And there's some steps... Um, that the central bank can can take to to do this, um, and one is to help the banks restore their the problems on their balance sheet, which they didn't do in Japan for a long time. And I told them many times in many publications, and you know my book Princes of the End was a number one bestseller in Japan, ahead of Harry Potter for six weeks. I was uh, on the Japanese media uh, very regularly, uh, 2001, 2002, 2003. Um, I was invited by Parliament. I was advisory to various uh, government committees, but they never. The central bank never did this. Whereas the Fed, and, um, and you see, at the time in the 1990s when it's proposing this first, from 95 onwards, um, Ben Bernanke, as academic, was participating in these debates about Japan, and he as head of the Fed, did implement one of my key recommendations. And that was the only central bank in the world that did that in 2008, was the Fed. Namely, he um, took away these non-performing assets from the banks, from the big banks, very quickly by simply, and this was my recommendation, by simply having the central bank buy them up. Of course, not at market value, at something, you know... Much, 20 cents on a dollar or higher? Much higher. Okay. Maybe not at 100. Why, though? Why? Stressed assets, right? So wh why, though? Because the banks are special. They create the money supply, and you need them if you want an economic recovery. And while they're impaired, you could have a 20-year recession. That's what Japan demonstrated, right? Um, and so my recommendation was the central bank should go and buy these non-performing assets, let's say at face value, at 100. Yeah. They're only worth 20, but the central bank goes out and buys them at, a, at 100. What happens? The banks, of course, are immediately restored. I mean, they are more liquid than ever. Their balance sheets are super strong. They can now go out and create credit, do their normal business. And, of course, you should impose some conditions. You guys stop the bank lending for the um, asset purchases, give give out loans for productive business but they investment. didn't. They didn't do it, though. Well, that's what yeah. we could impose. Yeah. The Fed didn't do that, no. Um, but to help banks increase lending again, if you get rid of the non-performing assets, you buy them up, um, that solves the problem. And there's no tax money involved, and there's no cost to society. And you might say, well, hang on, there could be two types of costs. The central bank now has the non-performing assets. That's a cost, isn't it? Yeah, but the central bank is a special institution. First of all, it doesn't have to mark the market, so you won't see this. Um, also, 
Um, it you know central banks are always profitable because they create the money supply or they they at, at the core of the money supply process. Let's say. Um, so I mean that if you want central banks to be profitable, I mean you should arrest all the central banks for insider trading. You know, <laughs> of course the central bank will always be profitable. So it's not a problem that the central bank is purchasing, but actually they're not even having any losses. Why? If the central bank buys these non-performing assets from the banks at 100, they're worth only 20. Okay. It is possible to book this in the accounts of the central bank as a loss of 80. But that wouldn't reflect reality. And accounts should reflect reality as much as possible. What is reality? What is the true gain or loss that the central bank has? It doesn't have a loss. It has a gain of 20. It owns something worth 20. And what did it pay? Well, the cost of funding is zero to the central bank. So that's why you don't have to worry about that. It's a gain to the central bank to buy anything. But where's the money from central bank coming from? You could say the central bank creates it. Now, that, that will raise the red flag for you to say, well, hang on, there's another cost, inflation. And that's where we uh, come full circle. No, this does not create inflation because inflation can be created when the central bank and the banking system create and inject money into the non-bank economy, and they do this for unproductive purposes, they do this too much, you get inflation or asset inflation, right? But this is not what happens here. What happens is a, a booking exercise within the banking system. The central bank and the banks are together the banking system. And all we're saying is, oh, the central bank is now going to use its powers to clean up the balance sheets of the banks. That in itself doesn't inject any money into the non-bank economy and therefore cannot lead to inflation. There's not a single dollar this is injected into the non-bank sector as a result of this, and that's what happened. So bank credit recovered after a year, 4 5%, 6% bank credit growth. America was the first country to recover after the 2008 crisis. Um, and so you think it was the right move? It was the right move if, well, I mean, I would have done it even better because they should have imposed uh, certain rules. We know when you bail out the banks... Um, you have a lot of power, and they could have used this to say, okay, from now on, we're going to do this properly. They didn't do that. Secondly, they could have um, not favored the big banks so much. They really favored the big banks, and really, you should have done this. Do you believe in socialism? No, I don't. But, but it's a crisis. You see, I believe in the principle of moral hazard. That is, who is responsible for this for this crisis? It's the central bank. They should pay up and, and end it. It shouldn't have happened in the first place. Yeah, but central banks is getting money. The more they put into it, my dollar goes lower. So you're hurting me no, if no, you're doing that. There's not creating inflation. And you're delaying a time bomb. No, and so, and, no, and, and, no and, you're getting rid of this But as a capitalist, obstacle. I'm a capitalist. I'm a full-blown capitalist. I believe in capitalism. Well, then we must abolish central banks, and I, I would agree. We don't need central banks. But now that we have them and they're creating asset bubbles. Yeah, but you're feeding the, you're, you're feeding the machine, though. You're making it uh, – you're delaying the time bomb for the next generation that's to pay what, the price no, that's for. What the, the, you see, compared to Japan and the U.S., in Japan, the central bank didn't do this. So then we had a 20-year recession – all these suicides you mentioned, that's the result of the central bank. But let me ask you a question. In, if you the, see, because the central bank power is increased when they have boom-bust cycles. I have a hard time with and that. And this abolishes the boom-bust cycle. Can I we push you need... back and you push me back? Okay. I, I, just push me back in what I'm saying. So, okay, so let's keep creating fake success so the current people of power don't take a lot of hit because God forbid the too big to fail companies take a big hit. Let's protect those guys. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you get the average guy that's sitting there saying, well, you, you definitely believe in capitalism, but it's capitalism for the poor and socialism for the rich, right? Let's protect the bigger. And, and when, when a person gives me that argument, I sit there and I said, you're partially right because we keep doing this. So, so okay, so today, let's go to today. But I'm not saying... Um you know, what we should do is, uh, this is not success. You know, the central banks have created the asset bubbles. They should then use the tools that they have to quickly delete their mistake. That's, that's what I'm saying. Me, that's affecting me and my generation. It's, but it's not, you see. If the central bank does it in this way, there's no money creation. There's no inflation. In fact, that's the big difference to today, 2020. Well, so what, let me what, compare now. What do you mean that there's no money creation? Where does the money go to the bank? If, the, if they're going to buy a $20 stock rather than pennies on a dollar, they bid at $100, where do they get the money to give it to the bank? There's no money injected as a result of this bailout, say the, the Fed through its maiden lane one, two, three, you know, purchasing the non performing assets of the banks, okay? That in itself doesn't inject a penny into the 
non-bank economy because it's cleaning up the banking sector. It's an intra-bank transaction, you see, in the, inside the banking system between the Fed and the banks. Therefore, that in itself doesn't create money. And the proof is in the pudding, you know. The, there was no inflation. As I, as I was saying, yeah, most but, people were saying, oh, the Fed balance sheet. No, but sheet. that's not proof in the pudding, though. I, 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 dis, <laughs> I disagree. Because just because there's no inflation right off the bat, the first year, second year, third, that doesn't mean it is not coming. That doesn't mean winter is coming. All you did is you delayed winter for 10 to 15 years. Okay, and then me, severe winter okay, is coming. Then let me give you two more examples where, Please. This, where this was done. And then I think you'll, you'll get the point that it is a limited measure for emergency situations. But it doesn't actually create inflation. Therefore, once you are in the situation, you should do it. But of course, you should also see why did the central banks get us here in the first place and avoid that. So the two examples are um, Japan, 1945. What was the state of the banking sector? Well, it was actually worse than in you know, 1989, 1990 when the bubble burst. It was worse. In, in 1990, the non-performing assets in the banking system were 25% of the bank balance sheets, which is a lot. That is a lot. It's Anything more than 10% is enough to bankrupt the banks. But in 1945, the non-performing assets in the Japanese banking system were like 100% because they had two types of assets. They had um, greater East Asian prosperity bonds, war bonds forced on the banks, of a country that just lost uh, the Second World War. And secondly, forced lending to the munitions industry of uh, munitions companies that were also bust, many now not even in Japan anymore because, you know, Manchuria, uh, Korea, Taiwan are not part of Japan anymore after 45. So 100% non-performing assets, fine. Now the Bank of Japan decided, okay, uh, we've just been defeated, devastated. The cities have been eradicated. A lot of, you know, incendiary bombs, um, flat earth here where there used to be a city. It's not a good moment to have a banking crisis. Let's not have a banking crisis. They always have this option. So what are we going to do? We will purchase the non-performing assets from the banks at face value. It was actually a bit less than face value, but these are details. And that's what they did. And so there was, so after the 1945, much bigger banking crisis. How long was the recession? How long was the period in which banks did not lend to, to, to businesses anymore? Only one year. Then they revved up lending. The economy recovered. You're doing well. In the 1990s, when the non-performing asset uh, problem in the banking system was much smaller, um, how long did it take? 20 years. Why? Because they still had their non-performing assets. The banks continued to be risk averse. They reduced. They did not increase bank lending. The reason for the 20 year recession is very simply look at bank credit to the economy, negative for 20 years. That's why there was no recovery. It's because they constantly had these non performing assets, this obstacle on their balance sheet. Second example August 1914. The United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland declared war on Germany, Austria, Austria and Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. The First World War had begun. Now, the city of London bankers came to the government and the, the Treasury and the Bank of England and said, oh, uh, by the way, uh, we're bankrupt now. Why? What happened? Well, London already was the world's financial center. So all the paper uh, securities traded between Germany, <clears throat> Austria, Istanbul, and so on, was going through London. Or a lot of it was going through London. They were holding what then was considered irredeemable enemy paper, and it was too much. Value zero because of the war. They were bust. What did the Bank of England do? Hmm, we just declared war. The First World War is beginning. Um, let's not have a banking crisis. So they purchased the non-performing assets at face, at face value. And by the way, um, you can actually even make a profit um, with standard accounting out of this as well. So what, what I'm saying is that when you, when you are in such a bad situation created by the central banks, and we should hold them to account why we're here, but then they do have a responsibility to get us out of this in the quickest possible way without a long recession, without suicides by business people as we saw in Japan because of the recession, because the banks don't lend to them. So more and more firms go bust. That can be avoided. And it is this obstacle called non-performing assets on the bank balance sheets. And you can just take them away at zero cost to the taxpayer. Yeah, but that, I don't I, – I, okay, so let me, let me ask you a question. So – Say the economy at the time, where in March of 2009, we put $1.25 trillion into the market, quantitative easing. 
How much was in the market at that time? How much money was circulating at that time? Give could, me a number, give or take. Whatever, let's make a number up. $10 trillion, $12 well, trillion? I look at it on a flow basis because credit creation is actually a flow concept. Um, and whereas, you know, you're asking now about the stock of money, but really the question is how much new money is created. Now that in 2008 was, was actually negative because banks didn't create credit at the end of 2008. And the central bank, yes, put in trillions, but in total that was still less than the shrinkage of it, the money supplied by the It doesn't matter. Banks. It doesn't matter. All I'm asking is I'm asking if, if we had $10 trillion and we put $1.25 trillion plus another two hundred plus another $300 billion, so add that to $1.75 trillion, okay. and if we have a 10, 10 trillion, that's seventeen and a half percent. My money devalued one dollar. But lower. it's not. But it's not. What hundred dollars became eighty three dollars. You have to understand the transaction. I'm saying is is a transaction to shift assets from A to B inside the banking system that does not create any money in the economy. It does not increase the money supply at all. At all, and that's why. So where did the, where did the money show up? Or where did where did the two trillion? It doesn't show up anywhere, um, because you're immediately retiring it. You're you're putting it into these non-performing assets. It's it's the central bank saying, let's delete these non-performing. Was assets. there money given from <clears throat> central bank to banks? That's right. Was Which, there money that? Oh yes. Went from oh yes. Cent- okay. Absolutely. So where did that money that the central bank? It was bank retired. Came- it was retired by writing off those non-performing assets.